Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criteria, and I'm your host, one of your hosts, John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and with me today is a man who has no hats. I actually have a lot of hats, and I am the Adam Glass. I panicked, some, Adam. Some people call me Adam Hats, because That's of the hats true. I own. Why did I say that? I don't know. I also don't know why they call me Adam Hats, but... I know. don't either. Actually, uh, no, you know, I I've actually that. considered just making up middle names for you. I, uh, instead I, of, like, describing you. Um, two things that that brings to mind. One, one I just remembered why they call me Adam Hats, and it's because the person who started that uh, was watching um, the latest uh, uh, King Kong, and in the background, as he's going through the streets of... New York is a very classic New York uh, Times Square shop, or, or rather ad, billboard for Adams Hats, uh, which is which is a hat shop in like the 20s in New York. Um, two, on, on fake middle names, uh, our good friend Jonathan Marshall Hape, who does the music for the show, uh, at, we, we work together, and we have to sign out walkie-talkies occasionally, and he would sign okay. out his walkie-talkie and always write Jonathan Marshall Hape. Um, his full name for some reason. Uh, so I started signing mine out as Adam Horatio Glass or Adam Olympia Glass. I, I signed a different middle, like like 16th century, not 16th, but but like 18th century middle name um, right. to uh, to every single one of them every time I signed it out uh, just to make fun of Jonathan because I'm a bad person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are more just no, a bad you know, friend. But it was, it was, you know, it was a joke that it only mattered to me because no one else even looked at that. They were post-it notes that we put on the charger uh, just to let anyone know who came looking for those radios who had them. Where are the radios, yeah. And no one, no one ever came looking for them. So, you know, it was... It's a joke for one. It was a joke for me. Uh, well, now, me. Making fun of Jonathan. And the audience. And the audience. And anyway, now, thank maybe you, Jonathan. Jonathan if you thank you, Jonathan, for the music again. Yes, uh, Always good to wonderful. plug him in that. Uh, I'd, I'd send you to his band camp, which I believe is jonathanhape.bandcamp.com, but I'm not real sure on that. Uh, but you should go listen to it, nonetheless. Yeah, you should just type in Jonathan Marshall Hape. Well, I don't think the, the Marshall internet. was on his band camp, camp actually. But. Well, okay, then just... Yeah, but I'm worried that Jonathan Hape will get you... Listen, okay. I, don't, I, th- I think it's a pretty unique name. Is it? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. And I'm not going How to common is hate? Why are we talking about this? Because this is completely. I'm going to edit all of this out. No, don't. No editing. Okay. This week, yeah, we're I'm watching looking. Federico Fellini's 1983 film, And the Ship Sails On. Uh, this movie... Can you say the, can you say the real name? Uh, in the Italian? I yes. didn't even write it down, so I'd have no, to look it up I. in order to do Shoot. it. Uh, so Don't do it then. I'm not I was expecting to. you to. That's why I asked. Well, you know, I've, I've learned, doing this has taught me my own limitations. And if I can avoid... <laughs> when it comes to linguistics. If I can avoid saying a foreign word, I will do it now. Um, <laughs> and occasionally that pops up racistly, I admit. For instance, when we were talking about uh, Inagaki's samurai series, and we started referring to him as Marty. Uh, I don't know. I think that was, yeah, it was a little racist. <laughs> it was a little racist, as if I can't be bothered to learn his real name. Uh, well, we did learn his real name. You yeah. just can't say it. I know. I know. I'm a bad person. And it's really was just you. Because it was and, just me. Me and Donovan were fine. Yeah. And yet you still, you guys were the ones who started calling him Marty. Because um, <laughs> we didn't like to hear the pain in your voice, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. That was very, that was very kind of you. Nonetheless, this week it's Fellini. And Fellini is a word I can say. Right. Very good. Yes. Federico. Um, Ooh, that was nice. I can't yeah, actually do that. It's very flourish 1983 yeah. uh, and the ship sails on uh, fun fact about this movie it was screened out of competition at the Venice Film Festival um, the 40th annual when it came out um, and while it was out of competition it still received a 15 minute standing ovation which is a really long time to stand and clap yeah my hands would be raw people, after like five I minutes I want to know like 
How do you even get a 15 minute standing ovation? Because I do it for like a minute or two and I'm done. I'm, I just, I'm bored. I'm, yeah, I'm bored of like, clapping. What are we doing here? <laughs> I've shown my appreciation. Yeah. So, no, I was shown out of competition, huh? Yes. I certainly did not clap for 15 minutes after watching this movie. I liked this movie. Don't get did me wrong. Did you watch it by yourself? But I watched it by myself. And, and that would be weird. Well, that's, a, yeah. that's the thing, the crowd mentality, I think. You you start to die down, but you notice that other people are still clapping. So you You're have like, to start oh, clapping. Oh, man, again. we're to keep this going. And then it gets it goes. It goes, it goes, it goes, it goes, it goes. Yeah, I'm not I sure if the that standing little. ovations are an accurate measure of the quality yeah. of the product. <laughs> that's also probably true. Um, I know a lot of people who stand gave a standing ovation at the end of the first Star Wars uh, prequel. Yeah, yeah. Um, just because and it was a Star Wars prequel. And then after they went home and... and Thought about it for about Thought five about minutes. It. I should probably in the car ride home. <laughs> yes, yes. Walking they out of the didn't make theater, it all the way home. They made it know? to the car. It's like, they're, they're like, oh my god, did I did clap I, for that? I clapped for that. Oh, the guys are going to talk about this for years. <laughs> I all right. for... Dr- yeah, no, um, so yeah, this movie. Um, you want to give us any background on it beyond that, or are we good to go? I think that's that's about all yeah, we can no. do. Yeah. That's all we need. So, I want to point out, just... Right from the very beginning, we've tried three times, and this is the third time, right? That yeah. that makes sense. That well, it was not a logical sentence, but um, <laughs> third time's the charm. I actually enjoyed a uh, a Fellini movie. Oh, well, that's good. I'm very like I'm legitimately very enjoyed. It. And what I'm saying is, like Armor Cord, I could withstand. Uh huh. Knights of Ka- I can't say that one. Cabaria. I was so bored, I almost cried. I'm feeling this one. I, that saddens me actually, but. Uh, I did not like it that All right. much. It's one of those weird things. Like I like it more than I did when I watched it. Yeah, but I still will never go back and watch it again. Okay, no, I do. All right, you're right. Um, we've got yeah, we've got well, we've, we've got about seven hundred movies to watch right now. We talked you know. about it. I liked it. Okay. Yeah, but like now that I've seen this one, I don't re. I, it makes me like the other one less. Okay. Okay. Because I actually enjoyed this. So you are... Th- through from the beginning to the end. Every moment of it. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. This is very interesting because, um, you know, being being in the scenes I'm in, uh, there's a lot of people who will say things like, um, you know, I like old Weezer better than current Weezer. I like the early Wilco albums. Um, but, but this... Uh, this is the oldest, your, right? Your, this is the newest Fellini we watched. Well, that's what that, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I got so, turned around um, in my head. Most recent. So, so, so you're saying that that with Fellini's, as Fellini goes on, you you he liked. grows, yeah, and gets yeah. better, yeah. Because I like Armacord better than I like Knights of Cabrilla, mm-hmm. and you like which I'm better. not saying correctly. I know I cannot remember the that's actual okay. proper Cabrilla. I believe is what Ka- it is. But. Cabrilla, sorry, mm-hmm. Cabrilla. And I like I this one that. substantially more than I like the other two. Oh, that's good. That's good. As the time progresses, it yeah. seems like now I assume Fellini is no longer with us. He is not. I believe he died which is a shame because if he were still making movies now, I probably think he's probably the best director I've ever seen. <laughs> because like he was, he's get, in my mind. Well, because you know what it is, yeah. is this one had elements of for me elements of. Monty Python and some other things that took the absurdism and made it into a format that I could understand. I, it's really hard for me to explain what I experienced with this, but somehow it crossed the absurd like speed of sound. Okay, uh-huh. and suddenly that that explosion happened, and it was now absurd and funny, like enjoyable. The other ones were absurd, but not funny to me. Okay. I'm not making any sense. No, no. Uh, but, like, this one was, like, humorously absurd. Yeah. yeah. The other yeah. ones were absurd, but didn't feel humorous to me. Yeah. And that's... One one weird thing about this movie compared compared to the others is, is certainly the absurdity in Amacord is, is much more over the top um, right. than, than most of his other stuff uh, that we've seen. At least that we've seen, but, but seemingly more than a lot of his other stuff, period. Um, this movie, you know, Armacord, Armacord, we talked about, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's based on his memories of his childhood and it's, it's, right. you know, an idealized look back or, or at least exaggerated look back. This movie doesn't really seem to have a theme 
<laughs> no, but it's wonderful. But yeah, uh, so this it does have is... theme. It has more than one theme. It doesn't n- seem to know which theme is the main. Yeah, theme. yeah. It it, it 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 throws a lot of things against the wall, but it's not really interested in following any of them up. And in other movies that do that sort of thing, I would certainly uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't like as much as this. Um, right. No, that's understandable. Well, we comes talked to about mind. yeah, we talked about Prometheus. We've talked about a couple of their movies. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, what there was one we watched even I've watched even more recently that was uh, here's a bunch of stuff I think about things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I'm tired. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. <laughs> kind of thing. And like that's just yeah. how the movie ends. It's like a yeah. fade off into black. Um, yeah. No, this, this movie, one. Yeah. Go if ahead. this movie is interested in anything, it's it's sort of artificiality in a way. Right. You know, the the backgrounds are very clearly painted, and they're they're beautifully painted. Don't get me wrong. The, whoever their their set design. No, no, is no. The amazing. greatest thing ever. The greatest one of the greatest jokes I've ever seen is it's almost as though it's a painting. Yeah, yeah. They call she it. says as she looks at this at the moonrise, at sunset. Yeah, yeah. and I'm and like. And it is very clearly, it's a very clearly a painting, and like all of the water looks like it's just like it's just a, it's an like acrylic sheet. sheet. Yeah, 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 it is. And then the battleship is. I even have a note. I actually took notes during this movie. That's how much yeah. I liked it. <laughs> it. I actually no, I really did. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm good. I'm glad. Is I love how the battleship, and I know we're jumping way ahead plot wise. Yeah, but the battleship is a is a caricature of a battleship. Mm-hmm. It in no way resembles what a battleship actually looks like it looks Absolutely. like what a battleship represents it's yeah. just guns for days yeah walls and, even, and guns it's like a floating castle it's a floating castle that's always surrounded by a black crap and cloud and right right the st- smoke that never moves yeah despite being an austrian ship has like this fake acrylic text on the side uh, yeah, just to make it even th- more foreign yeah, um, just to make it unrecognizable as, as yeah. anything yeah, the sunset, and then obviously at the very end, uh, we, the penultimate scene, we pan out and and we see the set and yes. everyone working, and then pan that was through such all a the, weird ending. Yeah, and then pan through all that, and we see uh, we see uh, you know Fellini sitting behind the camera at at last, filming the camera that we're seeing. Um, or I we're know seeing, it's so weird. Where we're from. Uh, but yeah, you know, and we we see all the hydraulics, and and, and it is a very weird movie. But it's you know, it's it's a, uh, and even the way the movie starts, it starts in sapia, silent movies, and the only thing we hear is the projector running. As oh, if I we're know. Watching this, and then the sound <sighs> starts to slow. fade in, but just like the background noise at first, not even the voices, and then the voices come in, and then we switch to color, and everyone's singing. Right, and and none of the voices. E- well, okay, now I need to ask a question. <laughs> okay. Did your voices ever line up with anything that anyone no, was saying? No, here's why. Okay. Um, and it's not necessarily... Uh, was it an accident? No, no. I, I don't want to say it's not purposeful, because it's certainly purposeful. But it's not, it seems it's, purposeful. It's it's something he does. Uh, he ADRs everything. Uh, all all audio is added post-script. <laughs> okay. Uh, for, for Fellini and a lot of his movies. Um, I, it was less noticeable, I think, in, in Amacord. I don't know if he did it in Amacord. If he did, well, it was if he less did, noticeable. I didn't notice it then, or uh, I noticed but, it a few here, times or something. I think the internationality of the of the cast here lends to it because eh, I I wouldn't expect a British character actor, uh, the the guy who plays Orlando, uh, Freddie, uh, what's his name, Fred? I can't remember his last name. Anyway, I don't know. you know, I wouldn't expect him to to speak fluent speak Italian. Italian. Um, Though you know, maybe he does. I don't. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to. You want to? Yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, yeah, right. But, you don't uh, want to be negative. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. Uh, in any case, in any case, we've got everything is o- overdubbed and and mostly in Italian. Though though, obviously, there's a few. I was disappointed that my uh, my copy, which was the Criterion copy, didn't have any subtitles on any of the singing. Me Ex- neither. Yeah, I think for, I had the Criterion collect, uh, yeah. one too. The very first line, um, the very first line of the final uh, song. funeral song, yeah, where where no, no, we will not give them up. Everybody, everybody sings together. But yeah, right. uh, and and while we're we're jumping around a lot, another one of my favorite things in the sort of artificiality of this of this movie is that it is apparently the gathered people's singing. Uh, that sh- sinks the battleship ultimately. 
Yeah, it seems like it, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, the thing they're singing at it. No, no, we will not let them go. Even though they've already let the Serbians go, the Serbian right. one of the Serbians has has thrown a little hand bomb into the ship, but only one. And maybe maybe something has happened that that we started some sort of chain reaction. Chain reaction. That's, but the weird that's thing is, possible, the ship has fired cannons yeah. for yeah. But it's yeah, it's still been firing five, ten, five, ten minutes or something. <laughs> yeah, like it's that. still been firing at our cruise ship, and uh, and then. Then the singing. They're singing, and, and the battleship just explodes. And, I know. It's and, awesome. And the cruise ship sinks and no, pitches, and then we but zoom the out. But the absolute yeah. best thing about this movie, and when I fell in love with it, <laughs> yeah. is, the, is the narrator preparing for the sinking. Yes. Yes. Prim, like, with premonition. Yes. Being yes. omniscient allows him to know that it's now time to get in because yes. he is the omniscient narrator. Yes. Even the absurdity it's... hits a yeah. peak there for me. Yes. Because at first I'm like, why is he taking off his pants? <laughs> yes. I was like, is he going to bed? What's going yes. on? And then as soon as like it, I don't realize yeah. what's going on until he walks out with the inner tube thing. Yeah. The life preserver around his side. I'm like, oh my god. He's and it's been very... changing for the last ten minutes. Yeah, it's very interesting there also because he suddenly you know, the whole time he's been describing what's going on, and he's he's a character in the movie, uh, he's filming a sort of documentary about what's going on, which we haven't mentioned, uh, and if you haven't seen, uh, is a funeral for a uh, opera star. And this is the gathered other opera stars and, and arist- various aristocrats who were big fans of hers are taking her ashes to be scattered around uh, well, the island she was born on. If, right, but and if you haven't but, actually watched the movie, yeah. just... Take a go moment. watch the movie. Yes. Go watch the movie because it's the thing is yeah. so absurd that yeah. any conversation about it is going to make yeah. no sense. <laughs> no, no, it won't. But but yeah, so we go we we go that, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's talking about everything in past tense. Yes, um, and you're like, huh? That's weird. Yeah, or or not, or maybe was it past or was it like future perfect? This is about it, it, it might be. I think you're actually. I, I, think, you're right. I think it might be f- yeah. future. perfect. Her, I you know yeah, I can't. Anyway. I have to go back and watch it. But anyway, he's very he clearly tense, stepped into the role of yes. omniscience. Yes, he is very... no longer. Well, earlier in the movie, he's walking around asking who people are. He's directly addressing yes. the yes. people as when though he's... like he's he's yeah. the opposite of an omniscient. He doesn't yeah. know anything that's going yeah. on. When he's introducing everybody in the in the scene of them in the dining room, very early on in the movie, <laughs> he's getting um, people wrong. Yeah, he's getting people wrong, and people are yelling at him for it. Like, who he's... are you? I'm a famous director. Or, yeah. You know, and like, <laughs> Or Everybody knows who I am. Yeah, she's a famous dancer. Yeah, and he, he has no idea. And it's great. It's great. No, it's um, great. Yeah, he's the the furthest from omniscient. Yeah, and and you know in a in a way, um, well, obviously that that adds to the artificiality of it. I do like how, despite the fact that we've panned out and revealed this to certainly be a movie, our very final scene is still him. On the boat, on his own boat, saying, "Well, everyone else was rescued." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and don't worry about me, because rhino milk is delicious. And he's yeah. there with the with the rhinoceros who was on the boat as well. The rhinoceros, which earlier dialogue has established as male, by the way. But oh um, yeah, I didn't even pay attention to that. Yeah, I didn't even so, think about that. So I'm not really sure uh, sure what he's going. Oh with. God. Oh uh, yeah. But anyway. But um, well, you know. Well, maybe that was what was wrong with the rhinoceros. <laughs> maybe. Um, everybody thought it was male. Um, maybe. Maybe. So, no. Like, I... In most movies, I would think that panning out to reveal the set is amateurish. Yeah. Well, one or movie... Or stupid, or something one, like that. One movie we previously watched where that happens was The, uh, the Taste of Cherries. But and I didn't the, think that was bad there. And the very, it was weird, but it didn't. It was make weird. Me upset. It wasn't bad. Um, no, but it was very. It was very off-putting to me. Um, it was. It was not yeah. congruent with the film. Yeah, this. We wondered this why is, it was there. Yeah, this actually is congruent with the film. This. Yeah, you know, it doesn't feel it unusual. Of, it doesn't at all. feel unusual. It's like oh, we're panning out, <laughs> and we're watching the set. <laughs> oh, because he needs to reinforce one more time yeah. that it's all. V- craziness and fantasy yeah yeah but it matches the movie in a way that like says it's weird because the movie is so obviously supposed to be that artificial fantasy world yeah that like you're like oh yeah he just needs to smack us in the face one more time and say look this is madness 
Yeah, I re- I really like the moments, and most of them involve Orlando and his film crew, uh, where um, <laughs> where that fantasy uh, is is revealed to be not the perfect. You know, it's it's fantastical, but it's still not perfect. Like in the in the very first scene, uh, as the funeral procession arrives at the ship and they unload her ashes, uh, the cameraman's not set up. Yeah, and he has to make them back back so up. So he makes and them back up again. and do it again. It's so funny, yeah. yeah. Like everybody's like looking around a little yeah. bit uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. and of great. course Orlando forgets people's names. He doesn't know who certain people are. You know, it's if if this were if this were truly a f- fantasy fantasy yeah. musical, which you know we get into with everyone just breaking into song at normal, at, um, you know that those those things ought to be perfect. But there's the moments of moments of humor, of course, are that too. I really like uh, when they, for whatever reason, the captain shows all is taking everyone on a tour of the ship, and they go to the boiler room. Yes, um, it's awesome. Uh, no, I actually have a really I. One of the weird things I wanted to point out about that, totally uh-huh. different, unrelated, yeah. okay. is did you notice somehow Flea managed to make the opera singers a hundred times more grotesque <laughs> than the people who work in a boiler room on a ship? Yes. They oh, are hideous. Oh. You know, and that's- I almost got sick watching it. I'm like, I cannot look at these people anymore. If this movie, if this movie has any themes, it's also the relationship... You know, even even if it wants to comment on pre World War One uh, ideas, it is it is also a relationship. You know, and, and this is something we got into with *A Night to Remember* too, with, about the Titanic, you know, the relationship between the aristocracy and the the underlings. Um, and we get we get a little taste of that with the boiler room people because why why are they even being shown off? But at the same time, they're huge fans of these opera stars, and they beg them to grant a song to them. And the person they're begging says no, and then and then well, one, and of, the weird, one of yeah, and one, one of the, the other others starts to sing, and then they get into this competition. competition yeah. yeah, but the weird thing about it is, is honestly, like in the universe of this movie, it makes sense. Yeah, and it's really just makes the opera singers look bad. Yeah, and ridiculous. Like, they, they, the, I think one of the themes I read about online, and it was kind of percolating in my head, is that, like, maybe the theme of the movie is that, like, by the time we reached World War One, like that aristocracy, all the reasons why things were being done had sort of melted away, and all that was left was the sort of formality of it, like an empty yeah. formality. That created these... The world almost became a parody. Yeah. And that this is not as absurd as it should be. Yeah. That, like, it is absurd, but it is not so absurd as we think it is. Well, that I mean, that, that leads us into the, the philosophical and, and art ideas of absurdism. Where, you know, where right. post, post-World War One ideas, uh, you know, that, that the, whole, the whole world is absurd. Um, and, well, uh, but it's a bit late at 1983. Yeah, yeah, but still, but but it's really interesting because we're so far disconnected from that world that we think, oh, this is absurd. Yeah, but at the same time, it's not that absurd. Yeah, all these boiler room people know these famous opera singers, but none of them have ever heard them sing, yeah. or they've heard them on a phonograph or something like that. Yeah, and it's not that absurd that they would be fans of them. What's absurd is the way it goes down. Mm-hmm. That sort of refusal, and then a competition where the almost the coal miners or not coal miners, the um, the boiler room people start to yeah. look a little bit like. Can you believe these guys? Yeah, yeah. They, like the coal, they, the coal, the shovelers start looking at each other like, "What is this yeah. going to end?" Yeah. Once the once the sort of competition starts, they they lose interest, but they're they're listening out of respect, not out right. Of right. It becomes a hollow formality of like, oh man, yeah. we got to listen to this. We got jobs to do. We wanted to hear one like yeah. line. Yeah. And the same the same sort of thing happens when the opera when the the Russian opera singer hypnotizes the kitchen. Um, right. <laughs> or hypnotizes the chicken in the kitchen. Yeah, the chicken, not the kitchen, the chicken. Yeah. In and the uh, and the, the whole kitchen staff is gathered watching and then and then the chicken falls asleep. It's, oh, that's neat. But Orlando uh Orlando is the only one super interested, but he also got put to sleep by the singing. <laughs> well, and then the like the chicken the kitchen people don't necessarily get put to sleep. They just get that same like, you know, we got yeah. jobs to yes. do. Yes. 
And that yeah. always seems that, to me, that's the real theme, is, like... And I think that's what the person on, like, I think it was... I don't remember if it was IMDb or if it was uh, yeah. Wikipedia or where, but it was one of, it, it, it's from a review. And was talking about is really that sort of, like, that imposition of the high class on real life. Like, it, they, they're not... They are an imposition <laughs> to to the the functioning the proper functioning of things in this movie, and it's it's fascinating. I love I love like the that chicken falling yeah. asleep because everybody's kind of like mm, cool. Yeah, congratulations. That's, that's really neat. Um, put a chicken I gotta kill this voice. chicken now. <laughs> yes, it's your dinner. Um, but yeah, I, I'm 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 interested in you know if we can draw a correlation between that sort of reacting and and then the serbians the refugees um at 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 first everyone's like oh a few of them are very supportive of you know the charity of having them there uh a couple of them are very much oh they're terrorists get rid of them um the clown primarily the the comedian uh who who uh you know yeah, uh, on one like, hand, on one hand, insists that he's 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 not a comedian for children. He's a comedian, a sophisticated key, a comedian. But on the other hand, in person, eh, you know, he, he does, it does the impression. dumbest jokes ever. Yeah, and does terrible jokes. But then, but then is completely, you know, <laughs> these are terrorists and they need to leave. Which is an opinion he only show <laughs> that is only shared by the uh, the Austrian aristocrats and and their uh, their people. That, that these are terrorists that need to be kicked out, of, kicked off the ship. Um, and then, you know, a couple of them, a couple of them start bringing food uh, when when all of the refugees are watching them eat in the dining room. And at first, everyone's super well, uncomfortable. It's so weird because, like, we get into a little bit into Fellini's commentary, yeah. previous commentary on, like, the Catholic Church, and then yeah. the nun says, like, oh, divine... Yeah. Uh, Providence will take care of them. Yes, and, but, yes. But the weird thing is, is that, like, then the major D's are like, ma'am, they already have food. And that's yeah. where it gets weird for me, is they do. They already have food. It's not the same food. Maybe not yeah. as good. But if you're but starving and you just got picked up by a boat... Yeah. The, any uh, picked up food. Off of, yeah, any food that, keeps you, that is, you're alive is good. And so it's like, oh, you're bringing me all these things. Yeah. It's that same imposition on real life. Yeah. In well, my one, mind. One thing I liked about that scene is that the the first dining room scene where everyone's being introduced, everyone's eating very sh- very slowly, and obviously there's a lot of food. And and one thing one thing about the Serbians is whether or not they have food, they have their own food. So they're they're being rationed, you know, whatever they have. The rich right. don't have to worry about food rations. Um, these these areas they eat slowly and they're all very concerned about how they look while they're being while they're eating. Right. And then when someone but they're they're concerned out of being seen while they're eating how they look. But then when there are people actually watching them and paying attention to how they're eating, uh, they're really embarrassed. Like right. they have this unconscious concern in the way they're eating. But when when that unconscious concern is made conscious because people are actually watching them eat. It becomes such an uncomfortable thing for them. They can't eat. Yeah. That they can't eat. Which, um, <laughs> on yeah. the topic of... Sorry, we're all over the map because there's too much oh, to yeah. talk about. But, oh, yeah. uh, on the topic of that, one of the things that I thought was really fascinating was the choreographed eating at the very fir- beginning. Mm-hmm. Did you notice? I don't remember if, like... I don't know if that's something you were paying attention to or not. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. All their... Sp- no. Their spoons are rising and falling to the soup at the exact same moment. Oh man, I didn't even know. When they that. first when when he is first doing the introdu- like when the music's playing while the waiters are yeah. moving around. They are they are close to in sync with the music. Oh, that's All great. the spoons are going up and down simultaneously. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Oh, that's yeah, it's really weird. And then they cut into some dialogue and it stops. But like for yeah. that that musical scene when the speed's going faster and slower and stuff like that, their so- spoons are all rising and lowering at the same time. It's oh, weird. That's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's you know another thing about the artificiality is 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 how the the few scenes in this movie that play like they're musicals, even though this isn't really a musical movie. You know, everyone sings as they board the ship, and then that song is continuing as they start to eat. And well, and they walk up the stairs in time yeah, and, and they, stuff. It's they crazy. start to walk up the stairs in time, and then and then the the whole 
the whole climax with the Serbians and then the no, we won't let them go. And, the and then sh- maybe blowing the up a ship with words. And blowing up, yes. You know, that's very musical-esque. Um, but even more ridiculous than your average musical. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. Although because, it would make an awesome musical yeah. that I really, I want to see yeah. Yeah. Fellini's and the ship sails on as a Broadway yeah. musical. Yes. Uh, uh, you'd be too conscious of the uh, of the hydraulics yeah. when they're on the stage, and then... <laughs> right? But wouldn't it be all? But that's yeah. exactly what Fellini wanted. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Um, you know, I, I like how it's very clearly like this very terrible Serbian refugee camp. On uh, especially once they start uh, once they start being barred from the first class por- <laughs> portions of the ship, and the crew puts up the ropes to keep them off. They they seem to care even less about what they're doing. After they've been roped off in their right, their they're own like, "Well, this area. is our territory now." Yeah, um, but I mean, like, like the the crew is less concerned about them too because earlier they put out a fire and told them, "No, you can't have you can't have a food fire." Yeah, yeah, yeah no. It, but then, it, yeah, but then afterward, like, there's so many their fires. Their own, and, yeah, yeah, place and yeah. well, and they start. And that's when they start having like song and dance numbers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh, now this is our yeah place. Yeah, and then and then the the uh, the intellectuals go down to tell them why they're doing their dance wrong. Oh yeah, and like oh my god, yeah. I I actually like was talking about that or read, wrote about that because it's um I it was possibly one of the things that the um uh the men says is the most appropriately themed thing <laughs> for the era. Yeah. And yet, simultaneously, the most condescending thing I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. He says, that he uses the phrase, befriend the elemental spirits. Yes. And I died. Because it, it's totally appropriate for the time that this movie is supposed to be taking place. Yeah. It's... And it makes me cringe. <laughs> because you know Fellini is making this in 1983. And so he's saying yeah. to himself, this will sound absurd. Yeah. This will make this man look like an ass. Yeah, but it's it's what you know it's it's right, the sort it's, of anthropological it's, idea of the time. Yeah, that sort of really primitive, god awful anthropology. Yeah, of the time, and it, it was just made me laugh and like I cringe at the same time. I was like, I'm laughing and yet I'm like uncomfortable. Yeah, so I just loved it when that happened, and like, and then he gets like passes out from like the stress yes. of yes. De- of like telling these people how to dance properly. Yeah, and showing them, admittedly. I mean, he is, he is, but he's still, you know, he's supposed to be this this ivory tower. Uh, you know, he's never actually done the dance. He knows he knows how to do the dance because he's read about the dance. But when he actually goes to do it, it's too it's too much for him. Yeah, he can't handle it. Yeah, it's so great. He's like, I've read about this. This is you're doing it wrong, and it's, yes. oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, but but that's that's even more into that like that absurd uh, making that kind of study seem absurd, especially for the time of like saying yeah. you're not doing your dance. Yes. Correct. Exactly. It's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, uh, it's very Western culture critique, you know, well, it's a very, yeah. Especially for that time period, yeah. that, that kind of frame of thinking. Like, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. It's, it one it, and it again fits into the, like my personal theme for the movie of, the imposition of this upper class onto yeah the rest of the world like it it doesn't glide across the water it plows through it you know what i mean it like pushes well, exactly. its that's, way through it that's, and it, it makes waves just by its presence it's weird yeah i think that's definitely that's definitely if if the movie has any themes it's it's that the aristocracy especially at the time uh, was completely absurd, and you know, it's it's that what they were doing was so out of touch with the reality of the world that it might as well have been a fantasy. Because right, it was. yeah, this movie isn't, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, this is not. This is a fantasy, but it's no more fantastical yeah. than the fantasy that everybody was living in in 1914. Yeah. yeah. And it's a fantasy we still live in, you know, as right. as evident by our next movie. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. The same, yeah, the same sort of ideas pop up in Brazil that you know this is the absurd well, of course, in society. actual time and space, the movies are only like two years apart. But well, yeah, exactly. Also, also true. You know, and this is commenting on, but it's it's but they're commenting on totally different eras of yeah yeah human history. So, but it's also you know it's something that that everyone always struggles with. You know, that's that's 
Western, well, to the, not even Western society. That's a, that's civilization. a societal, human that's a civilization problem. You know, the the, uh, but yeah, and then obviously they go for different parts of it. And we'll, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get, get that the, one. We'll get the we'll Brazil, get that after we talk about next Brazil, time. Yeah. But, but yeah, but no, yeah, this is I. No, oh, I there's almost too much in this movie to talk about. Yeah, that I like. I legitimately enjoyed it, and I if other people watch the other movies and and think and feel this way when they watch those movies yeah. I can understand why they like Fellini yeah does that make sense that was a weird I, sentence I think, no no I understand what you're saying you, you, you like this enough that you understand people being obsessed with Fellini I think a yeah. lot of people see Armacord and have this reaction to it and that's what I wonder is like do other people yeah. watch Armacord and think man that was just wonderfully absurd yeah. But for me, Armor Chord was absurd without being amusing all the time. Yeah. I mean, it was amusing at times, but this is um, this is absurd yeah. in the way that I like my absurdity. And oddly <laughs> enough, it shows up in Brazil as well, yeah. which is absurd enough to make me think about the topic, but also laugh a little bit, like yeah. feel like amused. Yeah. Whereas just Armor Chord just didn't do that for me. I was... If it was absurd and I was confused. If, if memory, if memory of that of that recording yeah. is correct, I was mostly confused. I, I, I didn't understand the plot. This one I was able because yeah. we're almost looking at your classic journey story. Yeah, I'm able to follow the plot of this movie very easily, which is weird because doesn't is this the one that Roger Ebert said was confusing and he didn't? No, that was Brazil. Oh, I don't, one of them. I don't, one of them. Roger Ebert said that. Oh, like, you read. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, no. That was Brazil. Sorry. Okay. The, the movies actually, to me, it's weird that we watch them together because. Yeah. They flow together in my head very easily. They have very very similar things to say about society. I think. Um. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't bother to read uh, Roger Ebert's comment. No, no, no. It, it, there's a, there's a commentary odd, cause on usually, his commentary on yeah. Wikipedia. Uh, which yeah. is why I I know that. I got the wrong movie because to me it fits almost as well with this one. Like with, think, it's a little bit weird. Like sometimes yeah. things happen that I'm not sure why they're happening, but because the absurdity seems to fit the theme of the movie, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, there's something Fellini's been quoted as saying, and I, I'm, I'm going to misquote it, so I know, but uh, I know, but but basically, um, there is no beginning, there is no end. There is the story, and the story always goes. Um, and I think Amacord Amacord does that, you know, because because of an ideology like that, there's a tendency to have less plot. Amacord doesn't really have a plot; it's just it's a year in a life of right. um, of this city. And, I, and it's um, not a movie I dislike. Yeah, and it's, it's episodic because of that. Because of the, right, it's little vignettes. And there are scenes on. that are awesome. Yeah. Knights of Cap. Cabiria, Knights of Cabiria. I keep trying to say Capybara whenever I say. I don't know. Knights of Cabiria. I keep making it sound yeah. like it's a religious order. Yeah. Yes, you do. Um, anyway, it's 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 kind of episodic as well, and uh, you know nothing nothing necessarily changes for Cabiria, um, but she always has that idea idea that that things go on. There's no point in losing hope because life marches on. Um, right and and yeah, and then this one is actually called "And the Ship Sails On," and it's the only one that actually seems kind of funny. Has a beginning, and middle, ending. and end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the weird thing is, like, if memory serves, I, I'm I kind of overstated my problems with in this the beginning of this podcast because I wanted to yeah. emphasize, yeah, why no. I like this movie so much. I understand. Knights what of Kabiria is actually not that bad. I found it seemed to have a beginning, middle, and end. Mm-hmm. Even though she continues on, yeah, she has an arc to her story. Yeah, she well, doesn't was, grow in her arc. <laughs> that was also made. That but was made at a time when Fellini was was more on a uh, neo realism end of of his spectrum. You know, it's it's much less absurd than it. Right, and than and I just didn't. I'm not a huge fan of that one because her yeah. character is hard to deal with. Uh, but, like, this one, yeah, he has a very clear beginning, middle, and end. The The ship sinks, the movie ends. And yeah. the ship sails, the movie starts. Yeah. 
and then absurdity happens. It has a middle. <laughs> yeah, the middle is a little less clear. Um, but uh, no, it, it's. And I think I like that a little bit better. I prefer the structure. Armacord is nice because some of the vignettes are wonderful. Yeah. But then some of the vignettes are like, why am I watching this still? For me, at least. Yeah. It's been a while, but I, that's a feeling I remember. So. Uh, I just keep coming back to Orlando being my favorite character and obviously he's a, he's a great character it's not it's nothing surprising that he's my favorite character but like all, all of my notes almost all of my notes that actually quote something or something he said <laughs> uh, he's talking about I can't even remember who he's talking about but he, 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 he says to a guy or he says about a guy his penis is enormous and violet colored yeah and then pauses or, and realizes or, or what he's so just I've said heard, is, yeah. that's just something I heard of course <laughs> yeah, no, it's wonderful yeah. because, but it's things like that that made me feel like I liked it more. Yeah, because one of the things about the other movies is, well, especially Armacord. Like again, Knights of Cabiria is not that absurd. Uh-huh. In fact, it's not terribly absurd, except for like in her in the character's behavior. Um, but sh- this one plays the absurd with small jokes that feel like they are meant to make you deal with the absurdism a little bit better. Mm-hmm. It's real. I really can't explain it, but like it lightens the absurdism a little bit because when he addresses the camera and says stuff like that, that's just meant to be a joke. It takes you out of the absurdity a little bit and says, no, that was just a joke. And, it makes me more comfortable with it. it. That's where I get into things like reminding me of Monty Python and things like that. Mm-hmm. Is that, like, well, now I'm just going to tell a joke. Yeah. And it's just going to be a joke. Yeah. It's not an absurdist view of the world. It's just a joke. Yeah. And yeah, maybe it's in the narration of the movie, but everybody knows it's a joke. So. Yes. Violet, <laughs> enormous and violent. Enormous and violent. I love it, yeah. <laughs> No, uh, I la- I actually, it's probably one of the few times I've laughed out loud during a lost in cri- or in a during a Criterion movie, is when I read that on the screen. I was like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. It's great. There were a lot of moments in this movie I laughed. No, yeah, I had more than one. Uh, I also really loved the really scene laughed. where he he's uh, he's in the gym and dressed as a fencer to, and and practicing <laughs> yeah. his fencing terminology so that he'll he'll be able to surprise the. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Duke, uh, and get an interview out of him, and then the Duke's uh, the Duke's bodyguards tackle him. <laughs> yeah, before the Duke even walks in, but he still grants the interview. But he does it uh, in German, and everybody keeps misquoting each other. <laughs> it yeah, takes like, like ten minutes to major out what translation he's errors for yeah. one one yeah. phrase, and then we end up getting poom poom poom. Yes. In order to try and... Because he keeps... Everyone translates the word as mountain. We're at the mouth of a mountain. And then someone says the edge of a mountain. You know, thinking the edge of the cliff. But then then the Duke... Apparently no one no one can understand the Duke. Because there's got to be a word for volcano that he should be using. Yeah. Right, but maybe he's... Yeah, we don't... And I, you know, I wasn't really paying attention. It's like, why does... Why, does, why do none of the Duke's uh, followers, none of the people with him understand what he's saying. Right. And, like, the Duke says before he starts, like, something, like, really weirdly coded sentence about, like, I'm the least of them or something like that. Do you, oh, did you see that? I, I don't remember. I was really confused. Like, so before the interview, mm-hmm. the, the, the translators ask if the Archduke can give this interview, right? Sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> you can just edit that out. Um... <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, so, no, he says something to the effect of, like, I, of course I will, although I'm the least of them, or something like that. Hmm. Like, really self-deprecating. Like, he knows that he is not important. Yeah. yeah. It's really weird. Like, he's not... Because he's played off as, like, the most ridiculous... Yeah. Well, he's played like, off as... ...ducal as, as figure a ever. Yeah. And and you know we've got that whole subplot that that's barely there 
of the sister <laughs> the and the, the tall, the tall bald uh, advisor conspiring to have him kicked out, and then in the end, she has him arrested instead. Um, which is also very interesting because he's locked in a stateroom uh, right before, and you know we never hear anything about him, but he's locked in the stateroom right before everyone else leaves to go to the other boat. <laughs> It's like you're under arrest. We're locking you in the room. But then the very next now the boat's going to leave, and then yeah. is that the 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 Duke and everyone else get on the get on the other well, boat to take the service. Now to the I have a question battleship. for you. Yeah, the princess, not princess, is it princess? Uh, Does she they get refer on to the her boat? As the princess. I uh, actually, she may not. Um, I think I have a theory. Yeah, that this movie actually has a much that, that there's a much deeper plot there. Okay. That she has him arrested so that he doesn't have to get on the boat with the Duke. And she knows that this Serbian terrorist, who's probably not a Serbian terrorist, Maybe. is actually working for her, blows up the ship and knows that the Duke will be killed in the process. Maybe. Maybe. Because Maybe him that's... and his his two advisor type dudes, the translators, do get on the boat. Get on the boat. But I never huh. see the princess get on the boat. Because every time the princess moves from anywhere to anywhere, she's the main focus of the camera. That is true. Huh. We never see the princess move... In a crowd. She was always by herself. So she's all. I assume that's a theme for Fellini. That he never oh, has her yeah. move by herself. She never gets on the boat. And if she never gets on the boat, then her and the guy who she had arrested are the only two people who are not theoretically killed. Yeah. By the... Because you know that everybody who was on those boats that attacked the battleship are dead. Are, are probably Because he even yeah. said... Well, because the narrator even says, we don't know what happened to the rest of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're like, right there. Nobody, almost no one was killed when the boat sank, but we don't know what happened to the rest of them. And I can only assume that the rest of them is talking about. Yeah. I think it's it's something like that. It's very like coded, but yeah. Well, he's either talking about the Serbians or he's talking about because the, the last time people. the battleship. Well, it's the last time we see the uh, the boiler room crew, right? They're also they're singing, the but they're all on yeah. the steps as if they're locked in that door, right? So we don't know, but I assume that the Serbians and everybody who is with the Serbians is dead. Yeah. Yeah. So. I do. It's, it's, it's in my mind, odd. it might have been a very brilliant plot. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> that brings, that brings uh, you know, you might be reading too much into that. I'll I'm say, totally that, that, caught fine with believing yeah, that I'm reading too much yeah. into it. That, that brings a, another thing. That blonde woman who ends up going with the Serbians, the young woman yes. who, who falls in love with Makio or whatever his name is, yeah. the Serbian, who actually ends up throwing the bomb. Uh, and they do they do this quick like she yells his name even though we we've, we've not really seen her interact with the Serbians at all that I can think of. We see them making eyes of, at each other on the dance. Yeah, they do. Night, they were making it. eyes. Yes, um, and then they, uh, you know, she kind of just showed up in the middle of the movie, and even even yeah. Orlando comments, "Who's that?" Yeah, and then <laughs> he yeah starts his endeavor to yeah. woo her or something. Like yes, that. Um, but then but then she she runs and yells Mikio and and. They they pose like like they do these five turning poses yeah, that look like weird. they're posing for wedding photos. Just really, it's really interesting. I liked it. And they're hanging on each other, and then they get on the ship, and then he uh, he throws the bomb that triggers the. Uh, well, but then the but then our at this time pretty much omniscient narrator, yeah, yeah, is discussing it as though as a historical event, as like a history professor would discuss it. Yes, and says that we don't know who threw the bomb. We see the Serbian throw the bomb, but because we're now in historical context, yes, we don't, we don't actually know. know that he threw the bomb. We I don't guess. none of the data from that point on where he switches into that that past tense yeah. is necessarily accurate. I, okay, I see what you're saying. All right. Because he uses a lot of maybes and a lot of like yeah. It's believe that. I mean, I don't know what I can't. I don't have any quotes, so I don't know what he you actually know, says. But he implies that it's that's, unknown. It's a further commentary on the artificiality of what we're watching. In that, that him in his very uh, intellectual description, his his reporter by, um, byline description of what's happened, uses a lot of maybes and we don't knows, even though we are in the process of watching all of that happen. Right, and we're watching it happen. <laughs> but we are up until now. We've taken the narrator as fact. So when the narrator starts switching to unknowns, yeah, we have to b- assume that what we're seeing is less it's viable than what than what he says. Yeah. So we we see this Serbian boy that was with her throw the bomb, but it could be anybody. 
Yeah. Or it could because he he lists off like four options, he and does. any of them could have been real. But I think that gets into like that's more of a commentary on the way that the war started and things like that. About well, yeah, how, and like how we get these stories, but who knows? Yeah, I think that's the that's right. No, this is someone described this as Fellini's version of how World War One started. Just that that last yeah, scene. it is yeah, definitely. And you know, I think that's it's it's a play on on how the war actually started because you know the. Obviously, the the assassination of, of Ferdinand was was what triggered the war, but at the same time, it was kind of just an excuse for war. Everybody was, you know, everybody was itching for war. So whatever, right, right. Like, whatever did, did, did one them grenade, or were yeah. they already firing, or yeah. was it an accident? Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's the same. It's the same with the reality of the situation. Yeah, uh, a Serbian anarchist assassinated Archduke Ferdinand, but. You know, he had a reason for doing that, so was, you know, and 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 the itchy trigger fingers of the entire, you know, the the war itself was right, right. But like, why just... does a Serbian terrorist, necess- or anarchist, necessarily beget war? Yeah, exactly. It begets you know, why... like some sort of criminal investigation. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah it, it it gets in the same thing. Like that battleship has no reason to open fire on a cruise ship. There's no way yeah. the cruise ship has guns. Exactly. You know. So it, it's their it's actions not are an enemy, regardless even, of the same. Yeah. Yeah. No way a cruise ship carrying ashes to a grave yeah. is an enemy. Yeah. Even if they're not even if, if no one on that cruise ship is on the level about what's going on, they have no reason to start firing on the cruise ship. Right. It, there's no way it has guns. Yeah. It's no threat. It certainly and doesn't so, have have guns that would threaten that battle. Well, that's what I mean. With like, its it rows have and rows and rows large of cannons. Guns. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it, the whole thing is absurd, and, it, and so like these factual pieces of information are unclear, but also irrelevant. Yeah. And yeah, no, it is. I definitely agree with that. Whoever said yeah. that this is Fellini's version of how World War One started, because that's yeah. yeah. And you know that's essentially what Orlando's saying too. So yeah, it is. Yeah, he is, but. Well, and then, like, you get into that, like, he even brings up World War One a couple times, and, like, especially with the uh, the Duke's interview, and... Yeah, he asks about the international situation. And yeah, this takes place, you know, it takes place in 1914, so, and, and they even, they mention the assassination when they're, we're talking about right. why the Serbians are there and, and what's going on with them. So, you know, this is, this is, like, within a month of the assassination. Right. So, you know, this is, this is the world on the brink of war. Um, and, and that's, but, but no one, no one is concerned about that, save one question Orlando asks to, to an Austrian Hungary. Well, and that this plays into the absurdity of yeah. this whole aristocratic, yeah, not the plowing through rather than yeah being part of like, Absolutely oh, agree. we're all here for a funeral for a famous opera singer when the world is about to go to hell yeah. in a handbasket and everybody knows it. Like, and everybody's, everybody everybody's is there for their own self-interest anyway. You know, right. Remember. Ildebrand is only there because she wants to be the next biggest female in, in opera. And yeah. Everybody's... Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, it, it, there's... Uh, there's too many great scenes, Adam. We'll never, ever talk about them all. No, we can't. Like, no. <laughs> I want to. Uh, Just watch Because every time... Again. every Yeah, every time I start thinking about, like... Oh well, that, that's it. No, it's like oh no, I just remembered something else. It's wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we get the um, the guy who's in love with, like, weirdly creepily in love with. Uh, I, you don't even. I don't even remember the opera singer's name. Oh, she's so yeah. actually irrelevant to the plot. <laughs> she really is, and we only ever see her in in the video that he plays. Yeah, in his little. Uh... And why is she dead? She's so young in that video. Yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, it doesn't say why she's dead. Uh, she certainly looks a lot younger than. Uh, obviously, it's a film, not a video, but uh, she certainly looks a lot younger than Ilda Brand, the other singer. Who's right, and we're and we don't have any reason to believe that that's out yeah. of date. Yeah, that film. Uh, her name is Edmia Tatau. Yeah, Tatau. Yeah. She's basically irrelevant to the plot. She's not actually yeah. part of the story, other than well, just I mean, the MacGuffin. Yeah, she's absolutely the MacGuffin of the story. It's the reason for going from point A to point B, but, you know. And they do, the, 
I guess the ship achieves its goals in that it gets the ashes from the dock to the... No, the ship is totally successful. Yeah, but it's the only thing that's As successful. the main character. Because no, one else, no one else has successful. any goals, so the ship does sail on. It. Well, it and the ship is the, the titular... The, I can't say it. Every time I say titular, I, I laugh to myself. <laughs> the, the t- sorry, I can't even do it. The uh, okay. tit- uh, I can't do it. it. To the point where the, saying the word bothers me enough that I can't yeah. get the word out. You know what I'm titular. trying to say. You say it. Yes, titular. That's not what I want to say. Titular. I don't think titular. that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> titular well, you keep saying ship. you you keep emphasizing tit. Uh, which but is I think isn't that the isn't that the part that's emphasized? Isn't it titular? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. I emphasize oh, okay. it in a different way in order to keep you from laughing. Is oh, what just well, it happened. doesn't it doesn't work. <laughs> no. Um, no, the titular ship is the only character with goals that actually achieves the goals. Yes. Yes. And is the main character of the film. Well, Everybody's yeah. riding on the back of the main character. <laughs> I guess. I guess. Or working within the main character. I'm telling you, man. It's the true. ship is transporting the ashes. Yes. It's not the even one the, doing it. Yeah. Not even the captain of the ship. It is the one it's that the is shot is. at the end. Yeah, and it's killed. After and it, dies. it achieves its goals and then it dies. It dies. It is. It is so the big character of the story. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we we'll, even we'll go. go and that. then when we pan out, we we very obviously dis, like get that sort of like now behind the makeup of the ship. Yes. That you would get with a made actor. Like it's weird, <laughs> but I think true. No, I think you make a good point. Uh, well, I think we can definitely say that this is this is a recommended movie from us. Definitely, watching it is definitely worth your time and energy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'd buy it. I think if it if I stumbled upon it, I would buy it. If I ever Maybe. just like was out and saw it, it would be perfect. If you're ever if you're ever looking in the Walmart two dollar bin, and right? It's and there. it's just there. It's like yes, of course. Um, yes. But it actually, since it's actually fairly hard to find, yeah, yeah. And you probably actually didn't watch it with us because it's pain oh. about the find. I uh, I I utilize my local library as I often do, um, and you so. should too, view- listeners. But Listener if you live in a place where this, library. yeah, if you live in a place where you don't have a local library, or you have one that does not carry movies, then petition your government. Yeah, <laughs> petition your government, whoever they may be, yes. to allow you to watch and the ship yes. sails on. Yes. All right. Well, next week we'll be talking about 1985 Terry Gilliam film, uh, Brazil. How did I forget the name of that? I don't How know, did you I forget the name of it? Good. Anyway, um, so yes, Brazil's on the on the docket. We look forward to talking about Strap that. Strap in. As, as we already said, a, a lot of similar themes of absurdity, at least. Oh, in, yeah. In our These two films like so blend pretty, together, it's ridiculous. Actually, fun note, and I, I might mention this again at the start of the next episode. Uh, the original title for Brazil um, was 1984 and a Half, uh, which would then... It's paying homage both to 1984, which has dystopian themes that... that are, are there, but also the movie Eight and a Half, which was uh, one of Fellini's uh, last movies. Huh. Um, and is, is yeah, Fellini, it, it's interesting that he'd pay homage to, to Eight and a Half in that title because this movie doesn't really have a lot of similarities with, with Eight and a Half, uh, which is kind of a, a movie about Fellini himself. It's very autobiographical in the way it plays out. But um, I've never <laughs> seen it, so. But you've never seen it. Uh, I'm sure you will watch that at some point. Uh, yeah, I hope I like it as much as going to be I on like this list. one. Um, so hopefully you will. Anyway, join us next time, once again, for Brazil. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again. Yep, see you next time.
You've been listening to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Oatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriteria at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.com.